It's a great pleasure this morning, this afternoon, to invite Peter. Um, I met Peter Frederick for the first time in front of the Indian consulate in San Francisco during the anti-CAA protests a few months ago. I still remember his passionate words that day about the imminent danger of fascism in India. I thought I had made a passionate speech, but he over, you know, he exceeded my passion that day. I still remember that very distinctly. Then I found out that he was a freelance journalist focusing on South Asian affairs for many years and who was largely responsible for exposing Tulsi Gabbard's close connections with the Hindu nationalist groups. It is his expose that had prompted Representative Ro Khanna to tweet that Hinduism of his grandfather was not today's Hindutva, which of course created a storm in the Hindutva dominated Silicon Valley. And now I have read a similar investigative report by him on the aspiring congressional candidate from Houston, Sri Preston Kulkarni, which I'm sure he will elaborate upon in his remarks. Peter has devoted the last few years of his work on the rise of Hindutva in India and its parallel rise in America. He's the author of several books, and in the current context, his detailed expose of Tulsi Gabbard in the Caravan magazine was a major contribution to the ongoing conversations on Hindutva. Peter will be talking today about his continuing work on the increasing political activity by the Hindu nationalist lobby, and will hopefully give us some pointers on how we too can contribute to bringing to mainstream America's attention that white nationalism is not the only threat to democracy and that they should pay close attention to Hindu nationalists who speak with a forked tongue, so to speak, the message of multiculturalism and minority rights here, at the same time supporting an authoritarian regime in India. Peter will speak for about 20 minutes, as I mentioned, and I will start with Q&A with a couple of questions, then we'll take questions from the chat room. So with that, it is my great pleasure, Peter, to introduce you to our audience this afternoon. Unmute. Urmila, can you unmute Peter, please? All right. Uh, there you go. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. So without further ado, in October of last year, Hillary Clinton made headlines for Tulsi Gabbard when she accused the Congresswoman from Hawaii of being a favorite of the Russians and suggested that Gabbard was being groomed by Russia to run for president on a third party ticket. Tulsi Gabbard, who was then running for president, initially benefited from the attention. She filed a $50 million defamation lawsuit and she got into a spat with Clinton, calling her the queen of warmongers and all sorts of other things, all of which was widely reported on. Less than a week later, however, a different story emerged. Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, a national media watchdog group which is based in New York City, issued the results of its investigation of the issue, concluding that the Russia accusations were a distraction from Gabbard's actual troubling ties. There is no evidence that Gabbard is any kind of a Russian agent plucked by Moscow to sway the 2020 election toward the re-election of Donald Trump, they reported. These hit jobs, they said, overlooked the proven fact of the RSS's influence on Gabbard, despite the evidence that this is much more a part of her life than Russian intrigue. <clears throat> the key takeaway from piles of evidence, they explained, is that the RSS draws much of its power from its followers in the diaspora. And Gabbard has been crucial to revamping the image of the Hindu nationalist in the United States and has in turn received crucial financial support from the Indian American far right. 
The RSS, briefly, for those who may be unaware, is a uniformed and armed paramilitary, which has an estimated 6 million members. Founded in 1925, it developed with inspiration from, and even actual interactions with, the European fascist movements in Italy and Germany. Over the past 95 years, it has spawned a host of subsidiary and affiliated organizations. And these include, in particular, a religious wing called the VHP and a political wing called the BJP. The BJP has ruled India since 2014, with Modi as prime minister. But the current administration is most accurately understood as an RSS regime. Nearly 75% of the central government's current cabinet ministers are from RSS backgrounds. And this includes not just Modi himself, but also those ministers who fill uh, many of the most important positions, including the ministries of home, defense, education, communications, and law and justice. In context of American politics, it's notable that the RSS has not confined itself to India. There are international counterparts for the RSS, called the HSS, the VHP, called VHP America, and the BJP, called the Overseas Friends of BJP. These groups all espouse the same ideology of Hindutva, a religious nationalist political ideology that believes that India is a Hindu nation for Hindu people only and wants to eliminate all Muslims and Christians, as well as assimilate all Buddhists and Sikhs. The leadership of these American Hindutva groups, the HSS, VHP America, and OFBJP, are all intertwined. And many of the executives of one group hold or have held an executive position in one or more of the other groups. The OFBJP, was launched in America in 1992 in order to counter negative press surrounding the Hindu nationalist project to destroy the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya, Uttar Pradesh. They say their goal is to project a positive and correct image of India in the West and correct any distortions in media coverage. And they work hand in glove with BJP leadership back in India. The former head of the group, Indian politician Vijay Jolly, said, we need to touch base with as, many, with as many among the diaspora as possible and to indoctrinate them with the BJP ideology. For years leading up to Modi's election in 2014, Jolly toured the US to speak at diaspora rallies and to meet American politicians. Tulsi Gabbard was one of those politicians. There is a now infamous image of Tulsi Gabbard wearing a saffron scarf with the BJP logo. In other words, a picture of an American Congresswoman wearing the colors of a foreign political party while speaking at an OFBJP banquet held in Atlanta to celebrate Modi's election. While speaking at the banquet, Vijay Jolly raised the eyebrows of many, like myself, who would later hear his words when he told Gabbard, who was then running for re-election to a second term, and I quote, we are sure with the support of the people of Indian origin, the non-resident Indians, and of course, the US citizens, your victory later this year is a foregone conclusion. I'm predicting today for your victory. Does that smack of foreign interference? It seems so, especially when, when one considers that at three separate OFBJP banquets celebrating Modi's victory, speakers who were donors to Gabbard's campaign publicly applauded her for supporting Modi before he was elected, for speaking against the US decision to deny him a visa after 2002, and for working against congressional efforts to recognize and condemn violent atrocities committed by the RSS in India. The song in America backed Tulsi Gabbard 
because they understand that the international community is increasingly worried about the sectarian violent politics of the Song in India, explained Professor Ashok Swain. They want some powerful political personalities on their side, particularly in the United States. They believe Tulsi can be one of them who can provide them cover from, inter from international sanctions. And that plan worked pretty well for several years, but it ultimately failed. One day after the fairness and accuracy in reporting, uh, after, the, after the group fairness and accuracy in reporting, rubbished Hillary Clinton's Russian asset accusations, reporting instead that Gabbard's most troubling attribute is her documented connection to the far-right Hindu nationalist or Hindutva movement known as RSS, the four-term congresswoman announced that she would not seek re-election. She did continue her presidential campaign, but she never gained traction and had to deal on the campaign trail with being challenged over using congressional campaign funds to help finance the very same OFBJP banquet where an Indian politician guaranteed her re-election. And she has now dropped out. It appears that Tulsi Gabbard will soon be exiting the American political arena, despite the best efforts of the Hindutva lobby in America. There continue to be troubling incidents of BJP interference or threatened interference in American politics, however. Last year, for instance, a few days after the August 5th annexation of Kashmir, Congressman Tom Swosey sent a letter to the US Secretary of State expressing concern and warning, quote, the Modi government's move could embolden Hindu nationalists to engage in acts of violence and discrimination against India's minority religious groups, including Muslims, Christians, and Sikhs. The congressman's letter provoked fury from a man named Jagdish Suwani, reportedly an RSS officer, or Karyakarta, a community outreach coordinator for the HSS, former general secretary of the OFBJP, and a close associate of Modi, who traveled from New York City to Gujarat in 2014 to be part of Modi's campaign team, and in his own words, privy to the brainstorming sessions during the campaign. Suwani is also the man who organized the controversial display in Times Square of the groundbreaking ceremony for Ram Mandir, which we saw happen just a few days ago. Infuriated by Swosey's letter on behalf of human rights in India, Suwani twisted the congressman's arm, apparently by leveraging the important role of his Indian American donors, and pressured him to retract the, the letter, apologize, and join a community meeting where he, where he harangued Swosey for the tone and tenor of the letter. Another more recent and even more blatant example of Hindutva interference in American politics came when Senator Bernie Sanders issued a tweet condemning the Delhi pogrom in February of this year as a failure of leadership on human rights. In response, a BJP National General Secretary tweeted, how much ever neutral we wish to be, you compel us to play a role in presidential elections. Meanwhile, as Gabbard appears destined to disappear from the scene, the Hindutva lobby is hard at work supporting at least six politicians, three who are already in office and three who are trying to get into office. One of those, although in a somewhat more covert manner, is Congressman Ami Berra in California. A member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Ami Berra was recently appointed chair of the Subcommittee on Asia, which means he is now the most powerful person in the House of Representatives when it comes to US foreign policy on India. Modi, Modi has earned his applause. Berra praises Modi's inspirational words and vision, for instance. And besides joining two of Modi's rock star receptions in America, which were organized by the, Hindu, by the Hindutva lobby, he was instrumental in arranging Modi's address 
to a joint meeting of Congress in 2016. His campaign finances boast large recurring donations from the same key figures in the American Hindutva groups who backed Tulsi Gabbard. Another, to a much more overt degree, is Congressman Raja Krishnamurti in Illinois. In 2018, despite huge pressure from his constituents and other concerned citizens, he attended an event organized by the VHP America and shared the stage with Mohan Bhagwat, the chief of the RSS. In 2019, he was the keynote speaker at a fundraiser in Texas for Seva International, which is the international wing of Seva Bharati, a social service organization affiliated with the, R with the RSS. At that event, he was joined on stage by Ramesh Bhutada, the vice president of the HSS. And weeks later, he joined Modi on stage in Houston, Texas, at the Howdy Modi Rockstar Reception. And then he was the keynote speaker at an HSS event in Chicago, which was organized specifically to celebrate the founding of the RSS. With so much willingness to carry water for Hindutva groups, it's no surprise that they have padded the coffers of Krishnamurti's campaigns. And yet another is Michigan State Representative Padma Kupa. Kupa has written extensively through a Hindutva lens. She blames Western bias for attacks on Hindu nationalism, complains that too many media reports are making the 2002 Gujarat pogrom the centerpiece of coverage about Modi, supports anti-conversion laws in India, which make it a criminal offense to change religions without government permission, criticizes non-Muslim women who wear hijab as a sign of solidarity, and quotes the raging Islamophobe Conrad Elst, a European author who says that Islam is reprehensible and insists, quote, the liberation of the Muslims from Islam should be a top priority for all those who care about India's and the world's future. Of these three who are currently in office, Bera and Krishnamurti both appear secure and relatively unchallenged, unchallenged for the moment. Bakupa, who was first elected in 2018, is currently seeking a second term and quite possibly harbors ambitions for a seat in Congress. And she deserves a great deal of attention because of these reasons. Turning to the three candidates who are currently seeking office, there is Rishi Kumar, who is running for Congress in California. And Kumar is a city councilor uh, in Saratoga, California, with a long track record of activism with the OFBJP. Writing about uh, in 2015, uh, he helped organize Modi's rock star reception in San Jose. And writing about his experience, he waxed eloquent about waiting to meet, quote, the man, the myth, the legend, while Modi fever took over the region. He further described how Modi is who I seek to emulate in my governance on the city council. Last year, while wearing a BJP scarf, he spoke at an OFBJP event hosted to organize support for Modi's re-election, one of several OFBJP, OFBJP events he has participated in over the years. Also in California is Ritesh Tandon, who proudly declares, my father was a strong RSS person. Tandon is running against Congressman Ro Khanna and his decision to run for office, he says, was motivated by Khanna's criticism of Hindutva. In August 2019, Congressman Khanna charted a new course for the Indian American diaspora when he commented on reportage about Tulsi Gabbard's RSS links, stating, quote, it's the duty of every American politician of Hindu faith to stand for pluralism, reject Hindutva, and speak for equal rights for Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Christians. As, as Amar Singh Shergill, 
of the chair of the California Democratic Party Progressive Caucus wrote, Kana's statement incited a torrent of hate and criticism from pro-Hindutva and pro-India political supporters, balanced by progressives and anti-Hindutva activists heralding his courageous stance. Shergill concluded, in the coming months, we will see a debate within the South Asian American community and the Democratic Party regarding the morality of Hindutva and how the party can reach consensus given the political crisis in India. That debate has begun to rage, particularly in regards to the third candidate who is currently seeking office, Sri Preston Kulkarni, who is running for Congress in Houston, Texas. Understanding the extent of the influence which the Hindutva lobby has on Kulkarni's campaign requires understanding Ramesh Bhutada. As mentioned, Ramesh Bhutada is vice president of HSS. He is also the founder of the first HSS chapter in Houston. His cousin-in-law, Vijay Palod, who claims to be a man who discovered, who, who claims to be the man who discovered Kulkarni, describes uh, seeing a steady stream of RSS workers at Butada's house over the years. And among those uh, appears to be uh, RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat, who uh, as Palod himself actually told me, uh, has, has been hosted and stayed at the home of, of Butada on at least one occasion, if not more. In 2010, uh, Ramesh, Ramesh Butada traveled to an HSS summit in India where while wearing the uniform of the RSS, he listened to Mohan Bhagwat declare that India, quote, alone has the capacity to save the world and humanity. In 2011, Butada organized an OFBJP training camp in Houston for activists, which was conducted by the political advisor to the man who was then president of the BJP. In 2014, Butada organized a phone bank in Houston of 700 people who worked, quote, round the clock, making calls, quote, to motivate voters in India to vote for the BJP. Later, when Modi won election, Butada wrote that it was because of Modi's RSS training and claimed that Modi's upbringing and the culture of the RSS meant that critics should revisit the RSS. In 2015, as one of Tulsi Gabbard's top donors over the years, he attended her relatively small wedding in Hawaii, where he was joined by RSS spokesperson turned BJP spokesperson Ram Madhav. In 2019, he, along with his son and his brother-in-law, was a key organizer for the Howdy Modi Rockstar Reception in Houston. And Ramesh Bhattada is also a key organizer and donor and fundraiser for Sri Preston Kulkarni's campaign for Congress. In this campaign, Ramesh Ji has become like my father, Kulkarni said during his first attempt at winning election. According to Butada's cousin-in-law, Ramesh met with community stalwarts, regardless of their party affiliation, to bring their financial power to help Kulkarni. Last year, when, Kul when Kulkarni launched his second campaign for Congress, Butada, who was described as having a strong emotional bond with candidate, was one of the major speakers at the event. Along with his time and energy, Butada has poured his treasure into getting Kulkarni elected. In total, along with his immediate family members, he has donated over $50,000 to Kulkarni's campaigns. At least $50,000 more has been donated to has been donated to Kulkarni's campaign by just seven other individuals and their families who are known as key executives in Hindutva groups in America. And the extent of Kulkarni's financing by Hindutva groups deserves a far deeper dive. But one thing remains apparent. Butada 
is pulling the strings of Kulkarni's campaign. Of the three RSS-linked candidates who are currently seeking office, neither Rishi Kumar nor Ritesh Tandon in California appear to stand much chance at all of winning. Kulkarni, on the other hand, is in one of the most competitive and closely watched races in the country. As rumors reach me, the Kulkarni, who has had a lengthy career in the Foreign Service, is interested in being assigned to the Foreign Affairs Committee, if elected. I can only speculate about what kind of agenda he would adopt on the issue of U.S.-India relations as the Modi regime spreads its fascist wings and implements its Hindutva ideology with increasingly lethal results. As Americans remain deeply concerned about the possibility of foreign interference in our elections by Russia or China, perhaps it's time, or rather well past time, that we begin also considering the issue of RSS interference on behalf of a Hindutva regime in India. Thank you. Raju, do you want to unmute yourself and say a few words before I go into Q&A? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Peter. Uh, that, that was extremely informative speech. I'm sure for most of us, the extent to which you've gone in researching all of this should be an inspiration for all of us who want to stop the March of Hindutva to apply ourselves to similar um, investigation wherever we live and to make people aware, our local Congress people uh, aware of uh, the second uh, nationalism that's on the rise, which can threaten the entire world. That is, I don't know what else to say uh, other than to say that was a, a great uh, coverage of your research. And I'm sure you have inspired today many people who are listening to also pitch in and add to your effort. Um, I had one or two questions for you before we open up the Q&A. Uh, you had mentioned Raja Krishnamurti. Uh, I've had several conversations with him over the last year. And uh, one of the things that he has told me that is that his topmost priority is defeating Trump. Therefore, 95% of his effort is going into that. And he's not really that engaged with Indian politics. But at the same time, he wants to, quote, unquote, keep his constituency and donor base intact so he can defeat Trump. Now, I did a lot into that. And uh, for someone who knows his politics better than I do, I wonder if you would comment on that comeback where uh, somehow it's seen as uh, defeating Trump means that one can claim complete ignorance of and completely forget about what is happening, especially when, as you say, he has been at so many presentations by BJP and HSS, where clearly what he told me rings very hollow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hope you can answer that. Thank you, Raju. Um, yes. Um, well, if he's, if Congressman Krishnamurti is saying that he's not really engaged with Indian politics, then I, I don't know what else to respond except that uh, it, that comes across to me as a rather blatant lie. Um, perhaps within, within Congress, uh, he, he might argue that, although his voting record would, would indicate otherwise, uh, as far as the way that he supported uh, advancing a, a very deep and intimate uh, U.S. India relationship while un while India remains under the under the Modi regime, and uh, then of course his track record, long track record, of um, involvement in these RSS uh, affiliated 
events and with these RSS organizations really speaks otherwise. Uh, and if, if he's not involved, then one should perhaps question if he's simply accepting these invitations out of total ignorance. And if that were the case, well, that's not a very good reason because then I wouldn't be willing to put a lot of trust in a congressman who's completely ignorant about the organizations with which he's involving himself. As far as the Trump issue, that also doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, perhaps Congressman Krishnamurti, who was one of the, who was out of, at the time, four Indian American uh, representatives in the House, I believe, uh, and the only one uh, who attended Howdy Modi in Houston, uh, perhaps he missed that Trump was the chief guest there aside from Modi. Uh, perhaps he missed that Modi and Trump did this dance of love around the stadium afterwards and that Modi basically said that he supported Trump's re-election. Uh, perhaps he's missed the way that then Howdy Modi was essentially replicated uh, in, uh, in India a few months later when uh, Trump went to visit India and, and there was another rock star reception for for Trump hosted there in India, uh, where Modi joined him on stage. Trump and Modi are very, very closely aligned. So the, the argument that defeating, that he, he's focused on defeating Trump and therefore he must ignore Modi doesn't hold any water. And then additionally, I would add to that, that if he's truly concerned about issues of white nationalism uh, growing in America, uh, especially under the Trump administration, that he, like anybody else, should be concerned as well about Hindu nationalism. Hindu nationalism and white nationalism are kissing cousins. The, the Hindu nationalist movement has a long track record of interaction with white nationalists uh, in the present day, as well as with the original European fascist movements, like not in, in Nazi Germany and, and in um, fascist Italy. And, and they also very, very much uh, share ideology. Their, their, their ideology uh, is in a lot of ways um, uh, mirrors each other. So that just doesn't make any sense to me that the, the Congressman would have an answer like that for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is with the work that you're doing related to Hindutva, how do you make sure that you are safe? How do you are you concerned for your own safety at times? Uh, I think that's something that many people hearing you would probably want to know. How you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, uh, this is sensitive work. Uh, I have had a lot of people very angry at me. I, uh, in my daily life, I attempt to be discreet and I, I also, I would say, I guess, in uh, overall, simply look to my faith and, and just have courage that I'm doing the right thing. And I don't need to be anxious or worried about what happens to me because I do it. Although I do take proper precautions as, as necessary. Um, Yes, I have. I have had a few uh, a few issues uh, when I was in I, when I was in Houston uh, opposing Howdy Modi. Um, I, I did have people I had people trying to report me to the FBI for opposing Howdy Modi um, on on uh, on social media and that sort of thing. I, I I've had here and there a few a few fairly overt death threats on social media none of which seems uh, serious enough to take seriously, but I, I have had that. The, the main thing that I've had um, actually is um, I've been physically protested by the HSS in, here in California, uh, which is my home state, um, in the Bay Area in uh, Congressman Rokana's district about a month or so after he issued this statement condemning denouncing Hindutva. Um, the HSS organized a, a protest, I think of about 30 people or so, outside of one of his town halls. Uh, and they, they were protesting his 
his statement, but they were protesting his statement uh, with banners with pictures of my face on it. Um, uh, so, so that was, that was, it was in a, in a lot of ways a sign that um, I, I'm on the right track and I'm doing the right thing. So in some ways it was encouraging. Uh, at the same time, it's a, it's a little bit scary. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if I may now uh, pass on the baton to Sunita to ask uh, questions from the audience. Yes, thank you both, Peter, Raju, for your um, enlightening presentations and grounding in, um, in what's right, and also for your courage, truly. Um, I'm going to just, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, it's now 147, well, where I am, it's 147. It's uh, 347 Eastern. Can we go until for about 20 minutes or so with q and Is everybody, are you both okay with that, Raju, Peter? Yes. Okay. Okay, so there's one um, question that came by email, which I'm going to read out. It's from Sumbela Zeb, who is also with us. Uh, uh, Sumbela also joined us on this Zoom call. The question is, as a South Asian American, I'm very, well, she's very ha happy to see other South Asian Americans get involved, but I won't support a candidate who takes money from RSS affiliates and who doesn't openly condemn the government and atrocities of the Modi regime, regime. When we ask about this, we are told we are being racist. How can Hindu American candidates expect Muslim American support when they respond to our concerns in such a way? Peter? That yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I'm very familiar with that. I'm routinely accused of, of being racist because I'm routinely accused of being a Hindu phobe uh, because I speak out, oppose Hindu nationalism, um, which as Raju has uh, very uh, eloquently explained uh, is entirely distinct from the Hindu religion. And as far as the question, uh, one thing I would, I would say is that one should consider that simply because a congressional candidate or any, any politician um, takes money from people who have ties to these Hindutva groups does not necessarily mean that that person is being supported uh, by Hindutva, being propped up by them. You know, the, so you know, anybody can donate to any politician. I, I, you, me, I, any of us can, can go to their campaign website today and give them money. But when you see, start to see this long track record where large amounts uh, recurring uh, over multiple campaigns are being given to these, to these people, when you start to see, as in the case of, uh, of uh, Sri Preston Kulkarni in, in Houston, that um, these Hindutva figures, these who are executives, they're, they're, not, they're not just, uh, they're not just um, uh, open or uh, amenable to Hindutva issues, but they're actually executives in organized uh, Hindutva groups in America who have strong connections back to India. Uh, when you start to see these figures take center stage in the campaigns of, of candidates, then it becomes a major cause for concern. And, you know, in some ways, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, such, a, it's such an irrational uh, argument uh, an irrational response to accuse somebody of being racist because they oppose what is intrinsic, an intrinsically racist um, supremacist movement, and they oppose people, congressional candidates, uh, politicians being involved with that or being in any way connected to that. And so I, I think oh, what I tend to do is I just continue forging ahead and, and just realize that, well, that that argument has, has no real rational basis. Um, and and, and uh, just take confidence in the fact that you're, you are in the right, you're standing for justice, for equality, and, and take that confidence and use it in your interactions with people as you're attempting to make these arguments about these politicians. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think that goes for all of us doing this work. That's really, really helpful. Um, th the next question is from Mohammed Nomani, 
And Mohammed asks, U.S. has not done anything effective against CCP-run Chinese aggression on Uyghurs until recently. How can we say that this will not be the same with RSS-run India? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I think that to a large extent, we cannot depend on the U.S. government itself to be the driving force behind taking action on these issues. This has to be done uh, on a grassroots level by individuals, by individual politicians. Um, as far as a formal government policy, um, the U.S. the U.S. has for a long time now, and increasingly so these days, but for a long time now, has lacked the moral standing to stand up and speak out against these violations of human rights around the world, whether it's in India or China or elsewhere. And I would attribute that personally um, to the fact that the U.S. has been engaged in these foreign wars of aggression overseas for decades. Um, you know, even tracing back to the Vietnam War, how can the U.S. be involved in, in Vietnam, uh, bombing innocents, uh, conducting the Mai Lai massacre, uh, uh, killing people in Laos and Cambodia as they're conducting the war in, in, in Vietnam? How can they be involved in that at the same time have they have any moral authority to speak out on, on, against atrocities being committed by other states uh, in the world? And so today, I would say that what we really need to do is move away from a dependence and expectation that that is going to, to be how we affect change and how we make an impact. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions that sort of echo each other. They're about the details of um, these donations received by Kulkarni. Um, there's a question, how can we follow the money? There's somebody asking if you will write a, a, an article um, that lays all of this out for so that it can be used, you know, for ed uh, education and also advocacy. Um, and just a moment, just uh, I'm, I'm Urmila. Can you make sure nobody is showing videos, please? Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, uh, how can we get details on donations received by Kulkarni from RSS connected individuals? Another question, how can we follow the money? Um, Asad Khan says, how, how can we find how much foreign money from India is being donated to these candidates and is that legal? Um, so these are the questions they, you know, there's more like that as well, if you could uh, address. Uh, regarding the question of foreign money being donated, um... That's a good question. Uh, in, in the case of, of Tulsi Gabbard, actually a number of people uh, who were supporting her um, very vociferously um, argued that because uh, there was no record of her receiving foreign donations because all of the donations that have been called out were donations by American citizens, um, which you do have to be an American citizen to donate, that therefore the, the argument that she was being propped up by these in-depth groups was not valid, that she had these RSS links was not valid, uh, which is of course not the case. Um, there's, uh, but I, I've never made that allegation about Tulsi Gabbard. I've, I, I'm not making that allegation currently about uh, Kulkarni. I have no proof that there's any foreign money being put into their campaigns. What there is proof of is that there is a long track record of uh, what appear to be targeted uh, donations um, uh, with oftentimes uh, uh, immediate family members all, all giving maximum amount of amounts at the same time mm -hmm. uh, to these candidates. For donations coming from these people who are executives, uh, top leadership in these American Hindutva groups. Now, as far as how to track that, um, all of this is uh, public information. Um, it's available through the Federal Elections Commission uh, website. Um, and it's, uh, it takes a, a few minutes to figure out how to use it, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory for how to search for a candidate and then how to search for um, a specific individual who's given to that candidate. Or you can even, you can even uh, 
view, download uh, the entire list of people that have, e that have ever given to that candidate and how much and when and where, you know, all of that. Um, or not. Anyways, as far as, as, far as tracking the, the RSS affiliated individuals who are giving, that takes digging, that takes a lot of legwork because you have to know who they are. If, if, you, don't, if you don't know who they are, then they're just they're just random names on a on a list of, of donors. Um, in the case of, for instance, Ramesh Bhutada, he is very clearly identifiable as a um, top top executive in, in the American song who's deeply tied to RSS BJP back in India, and who was incredibly active um, with the OFBJP's campaign here in America to support Modi's election uh, in India which as an aside, I think is an issue which deserves deep examination within the American political arena as far as um, how these American citizens are spending so much time to get politicians in India elected. And, as, and from the India side, I think Indians need to start looking at this and being concerned about it and questioning if they want all of these American citizens, many of whom uh, were either born in America or uh, immigrated to America and ended up renouncing their Indian citizen their Indian citizenship. I think Indians need to start looking at this and taking up the issue and asking if they really want that kind of interference in their elections coming from America. Um, so, as far as tracking these these RSS donations, you really you re it, it takes some legwork because you really have to know who these people are, and and and, and uh, if you don't already, then it's a uh, it's, um, it takes some time to identify them. But a, a, a good, uh, good couple of hundred of, uh, of major active uh, members and executives have uh, already been identified. Um, and so that is a good starting point. Uh -oh. Thanks, Peter. Um, this question from Habib Syed, I think you've uh, in part answered. Um, he asks, what measures are, is the US uh, government taking to kill politicization of fascist ideology in the US and throughout the world? I think uh, you've already sort of stated that um, Trump is already aligned with Modi and that grassroots efforts will help, but in case you wanna add something to that. But, and also Victor Begg is asking, we're working in Michigan to unseat Padma. Can you write a piece about her as you wrote about Tulsi? It'll help us. And that, that reminds me of an earlier question, which I, I, I believe I missed. Um, I have already written a, a, a short piece about Kulkarni, which was just the, um, the outcome of my initial investigation into him, uh, which I intend to continue. Um, and, and that is available, um, that is available uh, on my Medium accounts um, and has been shared through my social media accounts. And as far as writing about, uh, about Padma, Yes, I think she should be written about. Um, I I would be very interested in, in taking that up. She is, uh, as I mentioned, among these uh, six candidates and our, those already in office and those seeking election. Uh, she's one of the ones that I think that she she most likely has higher ambitions for Congress, and um, she she deserves greater attention. Uh, the the politicization or the politicization of fascism. Well, I mean, fascism is a political ideology. Um, as far as, as far as what can be done about that in the U S that's, that's the challenge of our times, isn't it? Um, we are struggling with that in, in America right now. We are struggling with, uh, you know, federal, federal troops, basically on the streets or around, uh, in different countries, uh, being accused of snatching, uh, people off the streets, abducting them. You know, we've seen that in India over, over some decades where, uh, uh people have been disappeared and, and murdered. Uh, in custody after being disappeared. And thankfully that doesn't sound like it's happening here in, in the U.S. yet. But, um, you know, Trump at, at the top, Trump is aligned with Modi. Um, Trump has been, um, you know, dog whistling uh, for, well, for white nationalism. Um, and nothing can be expected from him as far as opposition to fascism because the, the problem is that he's leaning in that direction. Um, we, need, we need to stand up and we need to stop. We need to stop looking to other people to uh, do something for us. And I think we need to stand up and take take some personal responsibility, and um, you know, really 
inculcate these issues, uh, if, if decide if we are actually passionate and actually against fascism and anti-fascist. Um, and if, if we are, if that's something that we truly believe in, we need to take personal responsibility for standing up, speaking out and doing something. Yes. Um, question from Razuddin Syed, who appreciates our efforts and asks, um, who and observes that a big percentage of Hindus are brought into the Hindutva ideology and think it's a part of Hinduism. Maybe Raju can also speak on this. And um, this uh, questioner goes as far as saying that an overwhelming majority is in the boat of Hindutva. And so how can we work together to reverse that tide? Well, I would uh, prefer to turn that over to Raju. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I tend not to believe in the theory that a majority of Hindus are subscribed to Hindutva. Uh, because I interact with my own relatives and friends who are every bit liberal in many ways. And there's a lot of reasons they're supporting Modi. And a lot of it also has to do with the extraordinarily strong public relations uh, program that Modi has been undertaking. So I do not want to start with the assumption that a majority are with Hindutva. They may be with BJP or Modi for many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how we can work together, uh, I think we should stop worrying about how many people are with us and simply do our bit, which is what Hindus for Human Rights has been doing. And we were just six people who started this. And uh, many people told us, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're gonna be rejected by the left. You're gonna be rejected by Dalit groups. You're gonna be, of course, trolled by the right wing. But what do we do? We can't just sit there and say, we can't do anything. So we have started this effort and it is taking hold. It is creating image even perhaps larger than life. And I think as things get worse in India, which I fully predict will get worse, uh, I think more and more people will wake up and we don't want to wait for that. We all have to do our thing. Uh, so this uh, presentation that I only briefly shared with you today is a PowerPoint presentation that I will share with all the participants today. And I hope you can add on your own things and share with people uh, to keep emphasizing repetition is often very, very necessary. You can't assume that everybody knows it. So why go over the same ground? We have to keep pounding on and repeating that this is not the Hinduism of my friends uh, that I used to went to school with, or this is not the Hinduism of my parents. It cannot be the same as Hindutva. So I would urge you to do that. And I think we will gain traction as we move along. Thank you, Raju. Um, and if you're in the audience here and you agree with what Raju said, then please join us. Um, join us if you're Hindu, join us if you're a, a person who cares about truth and justice. Uh, we need to work together. Thank you. Um, next question again from Sumbel Zeb is saying, um, Kulkarni's Muslim supporters, when we bring up Hindutva, say that his opponent is an Islamophobe and Kulkarni expresses positive sentiments towards American Muslims. And we have another question down further down that says, um, uh, it's, it's it's a lifelong, I don't, I don't have it right here, but it's a person who says that they are a lifelong Democrat and who else, what else can they do but vote for um, Kulkarni? So if you can answer those questions. Yeah, those are those are excellent questions. Um, as far as as far as what else can they do, and, and on that, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I'm here to tell the truth. I'm here to I'm here to explain that uh, this is this is the case with this candidate. Um, I can't answer um, what a voter uh, in that district should do. That's up to them and their own personal conscience. As far as the issue of his opponent uh, Troy Nils, I believe. Uh, being a raging Islamophobe, perhaps he is. Um, and uh, as far as the issue of Kulkarni uh, appearing to express positive sentiments towards uh, Muslims, uh, that that's true, and I've I've seen that. Uh, Ramesh Buttada himself, uh, the vice president of HSS, has been in America expressing positive sentiments towards Muslims. Um, he's actually he's. Uh, I believe uh, on the or found I believe involved in founding and definitely on the board of a of a local Houston Muslim group 
Um, he has, um, he, he has, he has been, he has been doing things with, where he's going out of his way to, to express positive sentiments towards Muslims. But the question is, are those sentiments sincere? Because while he may be doing that, Butata, not the candidate, but, but Butata uh, himself, uh, may be expressing these positive sentiments, he is deeply involved. He's a key person uh, in the American song um, and it, the RSS. Um, the RSS has a stated goal of eliminating Muslims from, from India um, and has acted on that goal multiple times over the past 30 years with, uh, with these pogroms led by RSS, BJP, VHB, etc., cetera, um, which resulted in, in, in the slaughter of thousands and thousands of Muslims for which there was never any justice. Um, and, and now we've seen in the, uh, now we've seen that after, for instance, the 2002, 2002 Gujarat pogrom, which um, Modi oversaw uh, to one degree or another, um, that the only result was that he rose to higher levels of power, became prime minister of the country. And Ramesh Bhutada, uh, uh, Modi Mo, and Modi owes Ramesh Bhutada to one to, to an extent uh, a debt of gratitude for his success in getting elected. Bhutada Bhutada was a tireless um, tireless campaigner over a period of years, uh, organizing the OFBJP uh, to support uh, Modi's election from America, um, and organizing uh, helping to organize uh, teams that were sent uh, abroad, uh, sent back to India to be boots on the ground to campaign for Modi. And uh, this, this man has a decades proven track record of uh, supporting the most Islamophobic, um, and not just Islamophobic, but anti-Christian, anti anti-Muslim, uh, anti-Sikh, anti-minority, uh, anti-Hindu who disagrees with the RSS. Uh, he has a decades long track record of supporting the group that espouses all of that um, and helping them to get power in India. So with this man taking such a central role in Kulkarni's campaign, um, how, can, how can Kulkarni be trusted that his sentiments about, his positive sentiments of reaching out to Muslims are sincere um, and not just not just what any politician does when they're trying to get elected and, and, and they're in 21st century America where they, they have to at least give lip service to equality, diversity, multiculturalism, and that sort of thing. Uh, can I add on to uh, what yes, Peter sure. said? Yes. You know, this situation, or perhaps if you can call it a dilemma among some Muslims, uh, it reminds me of BJP's approach to the Dalits in India. Uh, uh, whereas they, if from a public relations perspective, if you remember Modi's election, while he did absolutely nothing for the Dalits, did nothing to stop the atrocities, before election time, he invited a few Dalit uh, uh, manual scavenger women and washed their feet. Of course, made a tremendous impression on Hindus. Wow, look at our prime minister, you know, stooping down and washing the feet of Dalits. I, I think we need to, and I'm not comparing that to what Kulkarni said, but I'm just giving you a kind of an analogy of a party that has done nothing in this case uh, and using elections as a, more of a symbolic gestures toward Dalits. And I also remember the BJP Delhi uh, got this huge uh, walk and they were going to create a kitchen for Dalit people of Delhi. And all the BJP who and who's who were there to make a big show of it. Uh, and uh, it reminds me of that, but I, I, I know that your situation and the person who asked that question is not quite comfortable, but please remember to go deeper into it. Uh, and uh, another example I can give you is the recent expose on a group called APPWW in Seattle, who were created with all the various symbols of liberalism and multiculturalism and everything else. And this group went into their Twitter accounts to see what the actual conversations that are going on. They're discovered to be majority Islamophobic, majority supporters of Modi, and yet they were accessing 
and approaching con you know people council people in cities to even get funding and now it has stopped because somebody took the trouble to go into the details and show that everything was just a facade so i would just urge you to keep that in mind uh, i have nothing against mr kulkarni i didn't know much about him until the couple of days ago but i just want to uh, mention these two examples uh, so that we you know individual voters will have to go a little bit deeper and ask themselves if they're going to vote for somebody here who could potentially uh, support policy that could make things worse in their home country that's what i would say uh, one 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 thing i would add to that briefly yes go ahead the um i i think that w whatever whatever candidate um whatever office uh whatever whatever their background whatever affiliations they may or may not have i think that voters in general just uh, my 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 perspective is that it would be wise for voters in general to view with skepticism um and understand that the people seeking political power are willing to use uh to cynically use as props uh, anybody and everybody for photo ops that that help them to obtain that political power so i would just i would recommend some skepticism okay now we're um we're really running out of time and so i'm going to um we're not going to get to all the questions i apologize to people who are um asking questions um we will email everyone um after this and we will send raju's presentation we'll send some of your articles peter that you uh, mentioned we'll get those out by email to everybody who registered um and and just the, i'll just club together um the some of these questions in one last round of um questions for both of you um there's questions about uh hindutva groups and their impact on politics in europe um if you can speak to that um tom Mc tom mccausland um who we all know is asking let me i want to make sure to ask his question let me find that it's um how can we in the uk us or canada effectively persuade ordinary hindus um in our countries to condemn or speak out against hindutva extremism islamophobia and casteism and he would like um both peter and raju to respond to that um and then there's a, a host of questions about uh hss rss and the possibility of getting them banned in the us um and um of uh, reporting them to the um splc perhaps as a hate group um if that's some of some things that we could do um and i think why don't we why don't we have those and then and and raju when you speak um we're getting some um questions about how people can join us and what is next from hindus for human rights that people can expect so why don't you go first peter uh what was that first question um basically about uh hindutva organizations in europe and oh, then okay. how we can address um reporting uh reporting as hate groups and maybe getting banned those organizations somebody has even asked about haf about their you, their involvement in all of this so if you can do a general response to questions around yeah. hate groups and hindutva groups yeah i would say i would say that uh, that's a very relevant question about um the song about the these hindutva groups um and their activities in in europe um you know there was one example about a month ago uh the hss in munich germany had invited a parliamentarian from the bavarian parliament to keynote an event and some local indian americans or some local some local uh uh german indians um uh took action and uh contacted her office and and just informed her and she was completely unaware of 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 any of the information about this issue the background about this issue as soon as she learned she backed out um and um um yes hindutva groups are very active in canada uk um i would say particularly in germany as well and and a number of these other countries um i i would say the same thing needs to be done there that's happening here or uh, that we're attempting to do is to 
identify them and, and really start to track their activities and, and, and their past activities um, and, and document it and uh, proceed with working with the local politicians uh, and then just the, 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 the local citizens to uh, inform them. Uh, uh, the uh, declaring um, RSS or any of these groups a hate group um, or getting them on one of these lists like the uh, SPLC, I think that's a wonderful idea. I don't know if anybody's actually attempted to do that, but if not, they certainly should. Uh, they should, that should be an issue that, that is taken up. And I think that there might be a lot of scope for accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, getting groups banned, I think, I do firmly believe that the RSS is the world's largest and oldest terrorist organization. Well, uh, close to oldest, but certainly largest. Um, and that it, it should be banned. Uh, I believe it should be banned in India. But I, I believe that um, it should be declared as a terrorist organization by the U.S. State Department. Um, and in order for that to happen, um, well, we've already seen a few steps that would be necessary in that direction. A couple of years ago, the uh, CIA uh, in its World Factbook uh, listed the VHB and its youth wing, Bajrang Dal, as militant religious organizations. Um, and, and, and that's a good uh, first step. Um, but I think that it's possible I think that it would require a lot of groundwork, uh, a lot of uh, documentation, proof. Uh, of course, uh, the RSS has been involved in essentially every major anti-minority anti pogrom in India since 1947 and is involved in a host of other um, incidents of, of lynchings, assassinations, uh, but, and, and all sorts of other violence and, and intimidation atrocities. And um, that much of it has been documented, but I, I think that, you know, there's still more work to do to properly document that in a manner that would be uh, understood um, by the U.S. State Department. And then there's, of course, the necessary groundwork to actually engage and interact and, and, and pursue uh, that goal to have the RSS labeled as such as a terrorist organization. I think it's possible. Um, and then, uh, and related to that, I would say that um, th that's one of the issues that I perceive is that, for example, in 2018, when Congressman Krishnamurti uh, was at this event in Chicago, where he was um, uh, sharing the stage with RSS Chief Mohan Bhagwat, well, why is, why is Mohan Bhagwat able to get a visa to the U.S.? Why are these other RSS executives, and there's many of them who routinely come to the U.S. and tour around able to get visas? Why are, for, for that matter, why are these BJP officials who come to the U.S. and tour around for the purpose of indoctrinating the diaspora in BJP ideology and quite possibly fundraising and taking money back to, the, back to India uh, to support the BJP and, and so forth, why are they able to get visas? Uh, why is this kind of political activity able to take place on American soil um, or on European soil or Canadian soil? Um, and then as far as uh, this question about uh, what can Hindus do to uh, reach out and um, persuade people to other Hindus uh, not to follow or to reject Hindutva ideology? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not a Hindu. Um, I think that answer is, I think that question is best answered by a Hindu. Um, I think that's a discussion that needs to be had and is, is of course, happening as, as, as here right now. Um, a discussion that needs to be uh, held within the Hindu community. Yeah. Um, Raju, that's a good segue to you. Um, the questions were, that question that um, Peter just handed over to, to you, which is actually from a number of people, including Tom in the yeah. UK, um, but also how can people join Hindus for Human Rights and what, is, what are we planning? And somebody wants to reach you. And so just um, e if anybody wants to reach any of us in Hindus for Human Rights, just email us at info at hindusforhumanrights.org and we'll immediately get back to you. So Raju, if you want to close us out. Yeah, uh, the, the three or four points that I wanted to make. I don't remember all the questions, but uh, uh, as far as how you can help, uh, just go to our website, uh, 
I think one thing I wanted to mention is Hindus for human rights does not mean that only Hindu members are welcome as members or donors. We are Hindus speaking up for the human rights of all communities. So we welcome anybody who wants to join and donate and be part of our, uh, part of our work. And uh, please take, a, take some time to look at our website for uh, a lot of things we have done in a very short period of one year. Uh, we have done uh, advocacy in uh, Washington, D.C. We are working with USERF, uh, International Religious Roundtable. Uh, we have been holding webinars. We have been giving platform to activists from India. Uh, and today, I think if you ask me what the next priority would be, would be to shed some light on prisoners of conscience who are piling up in India. Every day we are hearing reports of even ordinary people who participated in the CAA protest being rounded up. And they have made this possible by completely redoing the narrative about the Delhi riots, making it look like it was all a uh, conspiracy by secularists and Muslims. And somebody has even published a book. They probably wrote the book before the riots started, in my view, uh, if I wanted to be cynical about it. So uh, that priority for all of you is to pay attention to what is happening to individual citizens in India under various guises and trumped up charges. And please speak up. Please talk about those specific to your Congress people. I know Peter mentioned that we shouldn't be relying on it, but at least at the local government level, people are much more receptive when you bring these kinds of issues. So that's the next priority. Uh, as far as Europe is concerned, uh, I don't have as much knowledge, but please be aware that we are already working with groups in UK and uh, we may start working with groups in Europe of similar groups of people who feel so much concern for their homeland in terms of the direction. Uh, and I really our objective is to build an international coalition of not just Hindus, but Hindus and Muslims and other groups who are willing to take on Hindutva and stop it. Uh, speaking of local uh, politicians, uh, I feel that you don't really need to do a lot of research because you have to. You should start with the assumption that they know a lot about India. If you start with the assumption that they know little, even one or two instances of people in their constituency who are indulging in Islamophobia will really wake them up. So that's what I would urge you to do. Uh, and one last thing for uh, Peter, you had mentioned that uh, uh, you, we already have uh, 200 or so prominent people associated with Hindu nationalism. And I'm sure people in the audience would love to know where they can access that so they don't have to redo all the research. Uh, you may, perhaps we can address that some other way than talking about it here. But uh, I wonder if you want to respond to that. Yeah, Raju. So um, one place you can access that is at my website, peterfriedrich.net.com, um, where I currently have uh, up and available a list of, I believe, 70 or so uh, actual executives in these uh, Hindutva groups, organizations who were donors to Tulsi Gabbard who I identified in, in, in the process of research. Additionally, um, uh, you, can, you can look to the uh, Tulsi Gabbard article that I wrote um, for Caravan, and, and that doesn't contain so much a, a easy, uh, a simple list, but the names are scattered throughout. Um, and um, then one other thing I just wanted to add, uh, as you mentioned, these prisoners the, of, of, of conscience, these political prisoners of conscience, I do want to, uh, as if, if I say nothing else today, I do want to raise my voice on their behalf, especially on behalf of the, the 12, uh, mostly all academics, social activists, uh, civil rights activists, um, lawyers um, who were arrested in connection with the uh, B. McCorgon case. And especially I want to raise my voice in support of uh, freedom for uh, the latest um, uh, victim of, of this witch hunt against, uh, against uh, outspoken uh, voices of resistance, of, of outspoken dissidents, uh, the latest victim, I wanna raise my voice for him, uh, which is Professor Honey Babu uh, from University of Delhi, um, and just say free Honey Babu. 
Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think um, Raju, you should just uh, um, say, I mean, close close the meeting. I think that those are all the questions we have time for. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of all of us in South Asia and for your excellent presentation. And I thank everybody who joined this Saturday. Uh, I hope you will start, if you haven't already started a journey, I hope you will start the journey with us to safeguard democracy and pluralism in India, which for a long, long time we've all taken for granted. And it's going downhill very, very fast, even as we speak. So please do your bit if not with us, with other organizations that are working on similar issues. And, uh, and we please do look forward to an international conference, virtual conference that we are planning along with several organizations where we want to highlight each of the several issues that we've talked about today. It might happen sometime towards the end of September, or early October. So we hope many of you will join and we can see what happens between now and then and plan on very specific actions, including a prisoner subconscious wall that we are planning to put up, which will be continuously updated and shared with all of our lawmakers in this country, who I see the Congress already has a, a particular subcommittee that focuses on prisoners of conscience. And what is shocking is I don't see any of these people that we just referred to being sponsored by any Congress people, including the Indian American Congress people. Uh, Rokana, for example, is supporting somebody from Saudi Arabia. I think it's time that all of them started to adopt some of these prisoners of conscience so that it keeps, we keep them in our minds. Uh, so again, thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Please contact info at hindusforhumanrights.org with any further comments. And we will take a look at some of the comments that we were unable to question, that we were unable to answer. If we can summarize some responses to those, we will add it to the email that we will send to all the participants. Thank you and have a good rest of the Saturday.